Today we're looking at uh, 1 Samuel chapter 9, and uh, we're going to be continuing in this story with the, uh, the children of Israel making this shift and having a desire to be like the other nations. And part of the desire that they had in trying to be like the other nations was that they wanted to have a king. Now, the problem with, uh, with that is that their hunger and their thirst was to be like the other nations around them. They did not have a hunger and thirst to be like God, hmm. to have the, the, the things that God was trying to show them, to have the character, to have the faith, the confidence, to learn to lean on, depend on, trust in God. They didn't have that. Their hope was not in God. Their hope was in trying to look like everybody else around them. Uh, and aren't you glad we don't see that today, right? <laughs> we don't see any of that on social media and none of that stuff like that, right? We see it too much. That's the problem. And so um, this story, this, this whole concept of what's happening here is nothing new. It's happened in the past it's, and it's, it's happening now. But what you uh, have to be careful of is when you put a petition to God and you bring something to the Lord and then, uh, and it's not of God and God gives you what you ask for. Hmm. Paul talked about that, how he said he will allow people to have a what? A reprobate mind so that they can do the things that are in, un, uh, inconvenient, that are not proper. Those are scary times if God gives that to you. We're going to see this, and uh, in, in what well, I should say, we are seeing this. We saw that last week. We're going to continue with it this week and the following week on how God allows this to happen. And we're going to talk about how we know that uh, this is God allowing another way to take the forefront in their, uh, in their lives, not the way of God. They're going to go another way, and God's going to let it happen. So, uh, so with that being said, let's go ahead and get the reading in. 1 Samuel chapter 9. Let's take a listen here. Chapter 9. Now there was a man of Benjamin whose name was Kish, the son of Abiel, the son of Zeror, the son of Bechorah, the son of Aphaya, a Benjamite, a mighty man of power. And he had a son whose name was Saul, choice young man and a goodly there was not among the children of israel a goodlier person than he from his shoulders and upward he was higher than any of the people and the asses of kish saul's father were lost and kish said to saul his son take now one of the servants with thee and arise go seek the asses and he passed through mount ephraim and passed through the land of shalashah but they found them not and they passed through the land of shalem there they were not. And he passed through the land of the Benjamites, but they found them not. And when they were come to the land of Zuth, Saul said to his servant that was with him, Come, and let us return, lest my father leave caring for the asses, and take thought for us. And he said unto him, Behold now, there is in this city a man of God, and he is an honorable man. All that he saith cometh surely to pass. And now let us go thither. Peradventure he can shew us our way that we should go. Then said Saul to his servant, But behold, if we go, what shall we bring the man? For the bread is spent in our vessels, and there is not a present to bring to the man of God. What have we? And the servant answered Saul again, and said, Behold, I have here at hand the fourth part of a shekel of silver. That will I give to the man of God to tell us our way. Before time in Israel, when a man went to inquire of God, thus he spake, Come and let us go to the seer. For he that is now called a prophet was before time called a seer. Then said Saul to his servant, Well said, come, let us go. So they went unto the city where the man of God was. As they went up the hill to the city, they found young maidens going out to draw water, and said unto them, Is the seer here? And they answered them, and said, He is. Behold, he is before you. Make haste now, for he came today to the city, for there is a sacrifice of the people today in the high place. As soon as ye be come into the city, ye shall straightway find him, 
before he go up to the high place to eat. For the people will not eat until he come, because he doth bless the sacrifice. And afterwards they eat that be bidden. Now therefore get you up, for about this time ye shall find him. And they went up into the city, and when they were come into the city, behold, Samuel came out against them, for to go up to the high place. Now the Lord had told Samuel in his ear a day before Saul came, saying, Tomorrow, about this time, I will send thee a man out of the land of Benjamin, and thou shalt anoint him to be captain over my people Israel, that he may save my people out of the hand of the Philistines. For I have looked upon my people, because their cry is come unto me. And when Samuel saw Saul, the Lord said unto him, Behold, the man whom I spake to thee of, the same shall reign over my people. Then Saul drew near to Samuel in the gate, and said, Tell me, I pray thee, where the seer's house is? And Samuel answered Saul, and said, I am the seer. Go up before me unto the high place, for ye shall eat with me today. Tomorrow I will let thee go, and will tell thee all that is in thine heart. And as for thine asses, that were lost three days ago, Set not thy mind on them, for they are found. And on whom is all the desire of Israel? Is it not on thee, and on all thy father's house? And Saul answered and said, Am not I a Benjamite of the smallest of the tribes of Israel, and my family the least of all the families of the tribe of Benjamin? Wherefore then speakest thou so to me? And Samuel took Saul and his servant, and brought them into the parlor and made them sit in the cheapest place among them that were bidden, which were about thirty persons. And Samuel said unto the cook, Bring the portion which I gave thee, of which I said unto thee, set it by thee. And the cook took up the shoulder, and that which was upon it, and set it before Saul. And Samuel said, Behold that which is left, set it before thee, and eat. For unto this time hath it been kept for thee, since I said, I have invited the people. So Saul did eat with Samuel that day. And when they were come down from the high place into the city, Samuel communed with Saul upon the top of the house. And they arose early, and it came to pass about the spring of the day that Samuel called Saul to the top of the house, saying, Up, that I may send thee away. And Saul arose, and they went out both of them, he and Samuel, abroad. And as they were going down to the end of the city, Samuel said to Saul, Bid the servant pass on before us. And he passed on. But stand thou still a while, that I may shew thee the word of God. All right, there we go. All right, very interesting story here in, uh, in this sense. What we're seeing here um, is the individual, the introduction of the individual Samuel. I'm sorry, let me rephrase that. Introduction of the individual Saul. And Saul is a very uh, interesting person. There are four people that are listed in the Bible that I think have the same characteristics as, as Saul. Saul is going to start off very good. He's going to start off very nice. Saul's a very attractive young man. He's tall, head and shoulders above everybody else. He's got it going on, and he knows he's got it going on. And he's good, and people will recognize him out of a crowd. He's not somebody that's going to look ordinary. He's spectacular in his uh, appearance, uh, appearance. And I think about that, and I think about three other people. The first person I think about is, you remember the prophet Balaam, and how Balaam was a, uh, an individual that had communication with God. And when Balak called for Balaam to curse God and Balaam went to God and asked shall I do this and you look and when you read the scripture it looks like he's starting off good he's communicating with God and every, but the next thing you know he's riding a donkey riding an ass and we see here there's another ass listed here as well and um, and the next thing you know he's at the point where the angel of the Lord is ready to slay him he start off good but end up bad the other person I think about is Judas. Judas was called by Jesus. 
And you see in so many portions of scripture where it says they went out, the disciples, including Judas, and they they preached and they healed. They went out two by two. And, and the interesting part is when you go out two by two, that means that Judas and somebody else was out there together. And they were doing what God, what Jesus told them to do. He started off good, but ended up very bad. And the final person that I'm going to mention that reminds me of Saul, and I think Saul is a perfect type of this individual, is Satan himself. The Bible says that Satan was the anointed cherub, sat in the very presence of God. He had all the jewels and all the things. He was a spectacular being. And he was wonderful until iniquity was found in his heart. So what we're going to see here is a in the life of Saul is a real kind of type and, and, and analogous to how Satan is. Satan will sit in the seat of authority and God allows it. And why God allows it is always a, a, a mystery. God does reveal it to us from time to time, but not that we can understand it. You know, we just got to have faith in God. You know, that's kind of like that whole thing that we're looking, looking at on, uh, on Wednesday in Proverbs, how we're trying to have wisdom. One of the important things of having wisdom is not that you know everything to do. The most important part of wisdom is that you have faith in God when you don't understand, when you don't know. And, uh, uh, and so uh, Satan didn't have that. Saul's not going to have that. Balaam didn't have that. Judas didn't have it. These very uh, uh, unusual individuals that start off so spectacular have so much potential and fail miserably. And that's what we see here. Um, and so what we're seeing here in the beginning is the, the, the rise and the ascension of Saul to the um, place where he's about to be told God's going to make you a king. And then we're going to, in, in several chapters along, throughout pretty much the rest of First Samuel, we're going to see Saul just rise up, see Saul have many victories, but then we're going to see his downfall. So keep an eye for this, uh, this uh, uh, trajectory that Saul goes on, and you'll see a lot of times the place and the point where he makes the mistake and begins to fall downward. All right? All um, right. And so let's go ahead and take a look at, our, 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 once again, 1 Samuel chapter 9. And it starts off and it says, Now there was a man of Benjamin whose name was Cush, Kish, the son of uh, Abenayal, the son of uh, Zerah, the son of Bekorah, the son of Philihah, uh, 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 a Benjamite, a mighty man of power. This is Kish. So what it's saying about Kish was Kish was a, a pretty significant individual. One of the things that has been said about the Benjamites was they were very fierce people. They knew how to fight. And a lot of the Benjaminites had this uh, um, trait about them that a lot of them were left-handed. And they were able to do a lot of things uh, uh, through uh, uh, athletics and, and might and power. And Kush uh, Akish is definitely following that same line. Verse 2. And he had a son whose name was Saul, a choice young man. That means what? The choice means if you had to make a pick, if you had to choose somebody, guess who you would choose? You'd choose Saul. A choice young man. A, and, uh, and a goodly. And, uh, and he, that goodly means it, it was just pleasant. You look at him. And you say, wow, isn't he a nice person? Isn't he handsome? Doesn't he look good? He's going to, Saul's going to look the part of the king. Remember, the people wanted a king like the other nations. And the other nations, other nations, they trusted in what they can see. They didn't, they don't walk by, by faith. They walk by sight. God's trying to teach Israel how to walk by faith and not by sight. Boy, that's such an important thing to do. A lot of times we think we, we're doing that. And one thing about God, every time you think you're doing it, God's going to show, well, you think you had a good stage on that, but you're really not there yet. And I don't think we'll ever get there completely, but we always will have these stages. And, and so the other nations, they go by how they see. 
Saul looks the part. He's goodly. And there was none among the children of Israel a goodlier person than he. That means he stands out by far for his shoulders and upward. He was higher than any of the people. Tall. Just a, just a you know, a, a magnificent, magnificent specimen of a, of a young man. Okay? All right. So God blessed you with all that. What are you going to do with it? Sometimes people are dealt a very good hand. You know, when I was uh, uh, in my, in my uh, early years, I used to play poker a lot. And the thing about poker is, is like, you could be a good poker player, but it has to do with how, what hand were you dealt? It's the same thing with any card game, you know, bid whiz, spades, you know, uh, uh, Jim Rummy. You play those, those those card games. A lot of times, you could be a good player, but you have to be dealt a good hand. And when, and then when a good player is dealt a good hand, you know, I mean, you're playing spades, you can run a Boston. You know, you can you can get all the you can get all the all the all the books. And so, Saul is dealt a good hand, but Saul's not a good player. You see, when you have a good hand, but you're not a good player, then a good player with a bad hand can still do better than you. And sometimes you see that all the time in a lot of different things. Um, and that's how a lot of times it is in life. There's a lot of people that were dealt good hands. They, they got power and money and health and all this kind of stuff, and they're not living up to it at all. And some people were dealt not that good of a hand, but they're staying in the game. They're hanging in there. They're using every little resource they got to continue to move forward in this game of life. And a lot of times that's what we have to learn to do. So we may not be dealt a hand like Saul was dealt, but no matter how uh, we, um, what hand we are dealt, let's not play it the way Saul plays his hand. He's going to play it very poorly. All right? But let's keep going. Um, verse 3. It says, And the ashes the asses of Kish, Saul's father, were lost. So what do we got? We got some lost donkeys. We got some lost asses. They can't find them. They don't know where they are. And Kish said to Saul, his son, Take now one of the servants with thee and arise and go seek the asses. So, you got the children of Israel looking for a king, and you got the future king of Israel looking for the asses. I think God's got a sense of humor. <laughs> I really do. I think that's why this is in the scripture. Because he's let it's, it's like it's he's he's pre-letting you know. You're looking for a king, but look at what he's looking for. Mm -hmm. All right? And uh, and so it, to me, I just find a lot of humor in that, and that God is very uh um, uh, poignant in the fact that he lets people know a lot of things ahead of time. And Samuel already knows about Saul. We'll see that as we go through the reading. Let's keep going. Verse 4. And he passed through uh, Mount Ephraim and passed through the land of, of uh, Shalashah but found them not. Then they passed through the land of Shilem and then they, uh, were, they were not and passed through the land of the Benjamites. But they found them not. So they're looking all over for these donkeys, for these asses, and they can't find them. Verse 5. And when they came to the land of, of Zuba, Saul said to his servant uh, that was with him, Come and let us return, lest my father uh, leave con uh, caring for the asses and take thought for us. So he's saying, look, my father, we've been going so long that my father's probably worried about how we're doing more so than he's worried about where these, these donkeys are. And so Saul's uh, comment is one that, okay, we've done enough. We haven't succeeded. Let's just go home. All right? And so you'll see here uh, in the concept of Saul's thinking something that God tells us not to do. Saul's giving up. He's quitting. He's not coming up with another strategy. He's not, oh, I, I checked everything else and I don't see it. I'm done. I'm quitting. Well, you were sent to find them. And you say, well, Wayne, that's kind of petty. He's, he's, that makes sense. The man's been gone for so long. Said, well, of course. 
Yeah, but you were given a task. Now, he was also uh, out there with somebody else. Because Cush, his father told him, you go and take a servant with you. Look at what the servant says. Not, not uh, Saul. Look at what the servant says. Verse 6. And he said unto him, Behold, um, there is a man. Let me read this again. And he said unto him, Behold now, there is in the city a man of God, and he is an honorable man. All that he saith uh, cometh surely to pass. Let us go thither. Peer venture he come and show us the way that we should go. All right. So now um, he's at a point now where he's like, okay, I don't know where to go. Uh, I hear that there's a man of God. Maybe he can tell us where to go because I don't seem to find any way in myself. Uh, my father's probably worried about us, and I don't know what else to do. So the servant now goes uh, and, and instructs and tells Saul, let's go find this man of God. And look at verse 7. And Saul said unto his servant, but if we go, what shall we bring the man? So the servant says, look, we're going to go check out this man who I hear about that knows a lot of stuff. And Saul says, yeah, but if we do go, what, what are we going to bring him? I don't got no, you know. And look what he says. For the bread is spent and our vessel uh, and uh, um, and there is no, uh, there is not a uh, present to bring the man of God. So the bread is spent in the vessel and they don't have a present to bring him. And so what is Saul doing? He's been given a good option, go to this man of God. And Saul now does what? Makes an excuse. So he's already quitting and he's already what? Making an excuse. Let's keep going. Look what the servant says. And the servant answered uh, Saul again and said, Behold, I have here at hand a fourth part of a shekel of silver that I will give to the man of God to tell us our way. All right, so thank God that, the, that Saul had the servant with him because Saul's judgment, now this is going to be the king. This is the one that's going to make all the decisions. But we see right off the bat, he's not very determined and he's not very resourceful. But fortunately, he had somebody around him that was. Verse 9. Um, verse 9 is an insert here that gives us a little insight about when they're talking about a seer. Look what it says. It says, Before time in Israel, when a man went to inquire of God, thus he spake, Come and let us go to the seer. For he that is now called a prophet was for time called a seer. So this is just inserted in here to let us know why Samuel is called a seer. Uh, but we know that Samuel is a prophet. All right. Verse 10. Then said Saul to his servant, well said. Well, Saul recognized that was very good advice. And what you're going to see is that's going to be the, the style of Saul's kingship. Saul is going to be one that needs his advisors. He's going to need people. He just doesn't have a whole lot of personal direction himself. He's going to need advisors. We'll point that out as we go through uh, these particular portions here. Then Saul said uh, to the servant, Well said, let us go. So, that, so they went unto the city where the man of God was. Verse 11. And as they went up the hill to the city, they found young maidens, going out to draw water and said unto them, is the seer here? All right, so now they're coming up to the city and it's probably either early in the day or late towards the evening because generally that's when the, um, uh, the maids would carry water. Based on the remainder of this story, I would think that it was towards the evening because it seems as though they're about ready to have uh, uh, their supper, their evening meal. 
Um, and so the women are drawing the, the, uh, the evening water. Um, and that uh, is something that they did. That was one of the things that we see throughout the Bible, that all the time when it came to draw forth water, that was typically the, the job of the women of that area. All right, and so they inquire of the women, and they tell them. Look at verse 12. And they answered them and said, He is, behold, he is before you. Um, make haste now, for he came today to the city, for there is a sacrifice for, of the people today in the high place. So you think it's just coincidence? No, God is still working in this. Keep in mind, that even when those that um, are not inwardly uh, associated and touching and really seeking God, God still is working through them. And so we got to keep in mind that though Satan does what he does in our world, God still uses what he does to strengthen us. And sometimes we forget that and a lot of times, it doesn't seem that way. It seems that all I'm doing is being attacked. But what God is saying, I will use that to make you stronger. Build your, a greater connection between you and myself, speaking of God. God will say, I will draw you closer by what Satan tries to do. What Satan did in the concept of bringing forth the crucifixion of Jesus through the works of Judas and all that he did with the uh, Pharisees and the Sanhedrin and all that, it put Jesus on the cross. But putting Jesus on the cross was what was needed to bring redemption to us. So a lot of the struggles that we go through, a lot of the difficulties that we go through, God is using that to make us stronger. And so um, it looks like, you know, Samuel is finding his way. He's getting where he needs to be, get to. And he finds the women. They tell him the seer is right there, uh, just a few uh, 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 paces in front of you. Go ahead, uh, walk fast, run, whatever you got to do, catch up to him because he's getting ready to pray for the sacrifice for the evening. All right, so verse 13. As soon as they came into the city, um, Ye shall straightway find him before you go up into the high place. Did I read that already? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I read that. Did I read that one yet? No. Okay, seems like I didn't read 13. Let me read it again. As soon as ye go up into the city, ye shall straightway find him before you go up into the high place to eat. For the people will not eat until he come, because he does bless the sacrifice. And afterward, he eats uh, that he bidden. Now, therefore, get you up, for about this time ye shall find him. So they tell him, go on up, get there, go to the city, and uh, he's about ready to bless the sacrifice, and the people are going to eat. They're going to have their meal. Okay? So now Saul, seems like everything has been made uh, 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 um, ready for him to be able to meet the seer. Saul thinks that the only thing he's trying to do is find out, uh, can we find these donkeys and can we go home? That's all he's focusing on. But, but there is more to it because God knows there's something in Saul that he's going to bring out to show people, let me show you what the nations around you, I'm going to give you a king just like these nations around you. You're going to have a king that's just like all of these other kings. What's, what's fortunate is that the next king that God gives them, that king is going to have a heart like unto God. This king has a heart just like the kings of the nations around him, just the way the people are requesting. I want a king like we want a king like all the other nations. And that's what God's going to give them. <clears throat> in the very beginning. All right? But uh, we'll see all of that transpire throughout the rest of the book of First and Second Samuel. 14. And they went up into the city, and when they were come unto the city, behold, Samuel came out against them for to go up to the high place. So when they got to the city, guess who showed up? 
Samuel. Right? And now look what happens. Verse 15. Now the Lord had told Samuel in his ear a day before Saul came saying. So God had already whispered into the ear, into the spirit of Samuel about what was going to happen in this, this encounter with Saul. So Samuel already knows the plan. And look what happened. 16. Tomorrow, about this time, this is what God told Samuel. Tomorrow, about this time, I will send thee a man out of the land of Benjamin. God knows who he is, knows where he comes from. And thou shalt anoint him to be captain over my people Israel, that he may save my people out of the hand of the Philistines. What does that mean? He's going to start off well. He's going to have some victories over the Philistines. And so you think about the Antichrist. I told you earlier there were the four instances with that remind me of Saul. And I just thought about another person, the fifth one, and that is the Antichrist. We haven't seen who this person is yet, but we have been given description. He's going to start off so well. And the whole world is going to be behind him. And the whole world is going to be like, yes. And that's another example, or another type that Saul is like, like the Antichrist. It's going to look good. It's going to sound good. It's going to have all the right words, all the right sayings. It's going to have all the the right uh, 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 background and history. But, but the end result is going to be awful. But God is letting you know. In the beginning, Saul is going to get victory over the Philistines. For I have uh, looked upon my people because of their cry is come unto me. Like I said, God uses these individuals to bless his people. Remember Balaam? And he told Balaam, go ahead, curse Israel. When Balak requested him, and when Balaam went to go curse Israel, what came out of his mouth? Blessings. So God used Balaam to do what? To bless Israel. All of these individuals are, are playing a, 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 a part in the working of God. It, it should not have been them, but God forbid that it, that, that it be uh, anybody. But if it's going to be them, God's still going to use it. It should not have been the desire of Judas to betray Jesus and to hand them over to the Romans. But it was going to happen. It just so be that Judas was the one that did it. Why? Because the Bible said he was the son of perdition. He had that in his heart from the beginning. And that's what we should keep in mind about Saul. Saul's going to have a many good things, but that, don't, that doesn't make him God's example of a good man. We always have to keep that in mind. Satan stood before the very uh, uh, um, presence of God. He was God's guardian cherub. That doesn't make Satan somebody that's a good uh, uh, personage today. Starting is not how it's going to be judged. It's how you finish. That's how it's going to be judged. And we got to make sure a lot of people will start well. And like I stated, Satan started well. Uh, Judas started well. Balaam started well. All these, you know, Saul, he starts well. But they're going to end up in disaster. And we got to keep that in mind. All right, so um, verse 17. And when Samuel saw Saul, the Lord said unto him, Behold the man whom I spake to thee of. This same shall reign over my people. This is the guy. This is going to be the first king. Verse 18. Then Saul drew near to Samuel in the gate and said, Tell me, I pray thee, where the seer, where the seer's house is. So Saul goes to Samuel, just thinking he's somebody that he can just get more direction from, and says, Can you tell me where the house of the seer is? Saul has no discernment and Samuel knows Saul 
because God talked to Samuel. Saul does not know Samuel because God has not talked to Saul. Verse 19. And Samuel answered Saul and said, I am the seer. Go up before me unto the high place, and ye shall eat with me today. So he tells them, keep on going up to the city, going up to the high place where we're, we're going to have the meal and the festival. You go up ahead of me, and you're going to eat with me. Right. So, for ye shall eat with me today, and tomorrow I will uh, let thee go, and will tell thee all that is in thy heart. I'm going to let you know everything that's in you. All right, I'm going to I'm going to bring to you some information that comes directly from God. Verse 20. And as for the asses that were lost 3 days ago, uh set not thy mind on them, for they are found. So Samuel lets them know. I'm a, and how do I can show you that I know what's going on before you even can tell me why you're looking for me? Let me answer your your initial question you're looking for these asses you're looking for these donkeys they've been found and they're good and so now that task has been completed he's now doesn't have to find the asses the, the, the asses they have already been found and so he said set your mind on them they are found all right and then he said and and on all that desire of israel is it not on thee all the desire of Israel that Israel has, what is Israel's desire right now? We want a king like the other nations. And I, and I have to emphasize that. You can't just say, well, they wanted a king. No, they wanted a king like the other nations. Because they could have said, I want a king and we're going to let God be our king. That's not what they wanted. They wanted a king they could see, they could walk before them. Why? Because they walk by sight and not by faith. All right. All right. And so it says, is not thee, uh, is it not on thee and on all thy father's house? Everything has been taken care of. Uh, God's going to grant what the children of Israel want and it's on you and on your father's house. You're the individual. Samuel is hinting to it. All right. And so look at what Saul says in verse 21. And Saul answers and said, I am a Benjamite of the smallest of the tribes. So Saul starts mentioning all of these things about um, uh, his, uh, his background. I'm a Benjamite of the smallest of tribes. Well, let's contrast this about... No, sir, I am not a Benjamite. No, he says, am I not a Benjamite? That means he is. He's he's asking it in this in the standpoint of a rhetorical question. Okay. He says, "Am I not a Benjamite?" This is a it's a question of the smallest tribes of Israel. So it's it's kind of a rhetorical question. And now, but keep in mind, it is the smallest tribe. But remember, we've already been given a description of Saul. Saul is what? Mighty man. He's a mighty man. He's tall. He's good looking. He, you know, it's probably, probably got muscles coming out everywhere, right? But now he's trying to play the humble route. And that's the thing about uh, the individuals like Satan, like, like Saul, like Judas, like Balaam. They start off with this humble attitude. The same thing with the Antichrist. They're going to have this humble attitude. But when they look in the mirror and they look at themselves, they're like, oh, I'm somebody. Look at me. But he starts off with this humility. I personally think it's probably false humility. Humility. Um, remember, Satan had all those great jewels on him. He looked so wonderful and, and, and all of that. And he knew how he looked compared to others. And so, but Saul, Saul, you know, sounds good. He sounds like he's being humble here. He said, he said Am I, it says, uh, I am not I a Benjamite of the smallest tribes of Israel? And my, and my family of the least of all the families of the tribe of Benjamin, wherefore then speakest thou so to me? Right? I, I'm not all that 
you know, come from good heritage. Why are you talking to me? Look at verse 22. And Samuel took Saul and his servant and brought them unto the parlor and uh, made them sit in the chief place among them that were bidden. So now they're sitting where? In the best seat, in the chief place from everybody that was bidden, which were about 30 people. They had 30 people there. Saul's got the best seat. Verse, 30, uh, verse 23. And Samuel said unto the cook, the person preparing the meal. Bring the portion which I gave thee, of which I said unto thee, set it by thee. So Samuel, because he was already pre-told by God what was going to happen, that the person whom I'm going to anoint as king, I will bring him to you this day, had already prepared a meal for him. Right? Now, Keep in mind, Samuel, even though um, he is God's prophet and he is a seer, at this point, Samuel doesn't know the nature of Saul yet. He will see it. And, and, and Samuel will point it out. And as a matter of fact, Samuel, when we get through a few more chapters, will be the one to tell Saul, God has forsaken you. God has rejected you. Samuel's the one that's going to tell. So Samuel's the one that's going to tell Saul, you are the king. He's also going to tell Samuel, um, uh, tell Saul, you have been rejected from being king. All right? And that's not going to be something that Samuel's going to enjoy telling Saul. So right now he's bringing him this big meal. And he said, set this meal before him. He told the cook to do that in verse 23. In verse 24, and the cook took up the shoulder and uh, that which was uh, upon it, and set it before Saul. And Samuel said, Behold, that which is left, set it before thee, and eat. All right. So he brings up this good portion of food, this good uh, hunk of meat, and sets it before Saul and tells him to eat. Seems like it's a good day for Saul. Right. And like I said, it starts off well. For upon this time hath it been kept for thee, since I said I have invited the people. So Samuel, I'm sorry, so Saul did eat with Samuel that day. So you got the, the, the uh, future king and God's seer or God's prophet sitting together. It's a good thing. But the problem is, you got two men, but not both of them are good in heart. Samuel is good in heart and good in action and good in deeds. Saul will have good actions in the beginning, but he's not good in heart. And we'll, we'll see that when we get to uh, some, uh, some additional chapters. All right, verse 25. And when they were come down from the high place... Into the city, Samuel communed with Saul. So after they ate and they came down from the, 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 the meal, from the festival, that Samuel and Saul were communing. They were talking. They were, they were together upon the top of the house. 26. And they arose early, and it came to pass about the, the spring of the day that Samuel called Saul to the top of the house saying come up that I may send thee away I'm going to send you somewhere you have a mission you have a task so they've been spending this time communing and now early in the next day he gives them this instruction um, and Saul arose and they sent out both of them he uh, and Samuel abroad and as they were going down to the end of the city, Samuel said to Saul, Bid the servant pass on before us. In other words, tell the servant to move ahead. He doesn't have to stay with us. He doesn't have to hear what we're talking about. Bid him to, to pass before us. And he passed on. He went ahead. But stand thou still and a while, that I may show thee the word of God. 
So he said, let the, let the servant keep walking. He let him go ahead of us. You stand still for a second. Stay here with me. And I'm going to show you the word of God. The, the, the sad thing about it is um, he, Saul is going to be given the absolute word of God. He's going to be dealt a great hand. And he's still going to mess it up. He's not going to play it well. Why? Because he's not a good player. He's not God's man. Satan was dealt a great hand. He was the chief cherub, but he messed it up. Why? Because he, is, he, he was that fallen angel. Judas was dealt a great hand, walked with Jesus for three and a half years, heard all the teachings of Jesus, messed it up. Why? Because he wasn't God's man in heart. The problem with all of these individuals is what makes them up, their heart, their spirit, their inner being, what they really, really want. They were all about what they wanted, not what God wanted. And that makes, that makes the difference. And we're going to see that. A lot of people can do the same thing that a lot of people do and won't get the same result because they're not doing it for the same reason. And so why are you seeking God? Why are you reading the word of God? Do you want to, I, I want to get smarter and know how to do things and I want to achieve in the world and I want the word of God to help me to understand. Well, the word of God can help you do that. It certainly can. There's no doubt about it. But if that's the only reason why you're doing it, then it's not going to produce a good end. If you're in the word of God because I love God and I want to continue to build my communication and my awareness and I'm obeying what God says, he says, study to show thyself approved. I'm seeking God. The, God, the Bible, t Jesus told us to seek and to knock. That's why I'm doing it because I want more of God and less of me. Then God's going to be uh, able to use you uh, in what you are able to uh, achieve and what you're able to do and all of the avenues and the doors that he opens up, God will use you in those things because you're seeking God. But if you're seeking to just, I'm just trying to make myself better, which we will see here, that's what Saul's going to be all about. That's what Satan was all about. And that's the reason why Judas betrayed Jesus for those same reasons, trying to make things happen for their better not for the betterment of what God is trying to do in our lives. All right. As I stated before, uh, this ain't the end. We're not done. We're just going to stop because we're at the end of our chapter here. Any comments or questions?